Thank you, everyone, for listening to Soul Talk with host Jeremy McDonald, the author of Peace Be Still. You can check out more about our shows or about Jeremy at soultalkradio.org and jeremymcdonald.net. And now for our show. I have uh, a, a wonderful guest on, uh, Dr. Stuart Savatsky. Uh, he has degrees in religion and psychology from Princeton University and the California Institute of Integral Studies a Kundalini Tantra practitioner since 1972. He was the producer of the World Congress on Psychology and Spirituality in India in 2008, which uh, featured more than 400 delegates from 40 countries. Welcome to the show, Dr. Svatsky. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing very well. It's good to meet you on uh, the air 3,000 miles away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just the one question I was going to ask you before we got started is what's the weather like in San, in uh in California, but that's probably beautiful weather although you're in northern California, so um it's ideal today. We went ideal. swimming it's outdoors. Good. Did you really? it, was, uh, it was in the 50s we went here to the today. Pu- outdoor pool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we're going to be talking, obviously, about your uh, your book, Advanced uh, Spiritual Intimacy, the Yoga of Deep Tantric Sensuality. Uh, the first thing I would like to ask you is, uh, um, I'm, you know, it, it, in some ways I was pondering and thinking that, um, you know, you're, a, a, I believe, a, a psychologist, a counselor, um, uh-huh. and, and, just, and I started to think, well, how does the tantric yoga or yoga practice go into that? And then I thought, well, it probably has everything to do with that. But how did you start to get into that that field of you know psychology tends to be a, it, it'd be more logical or uh, you know you right you know left brain thinking in some ways and then yoga tends to go in a different direction so I was just curious mm-hmm. to where you know what's well, your story I, you mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was in college in the 60s 67 to 71. And uh, now it seems like ancient history, but uh, for a while there it seemed like very nearby, and, and now it's kind of you know a nostalgic thing. But the, the belief then was through the psychedelic era that uh, the world peace was like maybe 10 years away, and the uh, secret ingredient was something that now was called consciousness or a shift in consciousness. And uh, I'm sure even today that that idea of, psych- of the psychedelic era uh, continues, but you know, th- th- my peer group uh, believed that. Wow, not only was it some, something to do with psychedelics, but in turning to India, as the Beatles did, and uh, Ram Das from Harvard, you know, uh, Timothy Leary, and uh, Richard Alpert, you know, uh, we, they were bringing back stories from that Indian had a, India had a different psychology based in meditation in Buddhism that uh, was very similar to what uh, uh, all the hippies were experiencing on LSD. And uh, I became a religion major uh, instead of a biochemist, which I had been before. And frankly, my uh, interest in biochemistry was related to uh, how, does, how do these uh, psychedelics work? And I read a book, uh, a Buddhist text, sort of by coincidence, and the book was saying a lot more directly to my experience than sitting in the lab and uh, cooking things up in test tubes and all of that. So I switched to being a religion major. And then, as my mother predicted, what are you going to do with that when you graduate? Uh, there really w- w- wasn't a lot, because I didn't wasn't interested in being a preacher man. Um, but I did learn a lot about faith. I learned about how do people believe in uh such things as loyalty or lifelong friendship. How do you uh, go through possible breakdowns or conflicts in relationships and have faith that they could be worked out? Because uh, religion, the study of it as I took it, was a lot about uh, how do you repair conflicts, b- b- not through force, but through uh, love and reconciliation. And uh, within a year, I stumbled upon a, a job of gra- after graduating, again, somewhat by f- f- uh, just a quirk, uh, uh, being a juvenile probation officer in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And I suddenly had this role of helping kids who had run-ins with the court. And uh, I had just also started taking yoga classes around, at the time, 72, and I thought I had something that could help, which would be yoga uh, breathing practices, rhythmic breathing, uh, yoga postures. Uh, 
eyes closed meditation. I uh, believed that I had uh, something to share, not just in how do you have faith that life could work out for you, even if you're uh, from a very disadvantaged background. Most of the kids that end up in juvenile court come from very poor families with uh, only one time can I think we're both parents even lived in the same house so how do you have faith that life could work out that I had some training in from my uh, religion studies but these yoga classes made me feel like wow you could really uh, feel uh, come out of a depression you could come out of a a stressful situation and make better decisions and uh, so I started teaching my probationers these are kids from like 13 to 18, uh, how to do simple uh, yogic breathing practices. And uh, then I even got into chanting. I, I would go into the lockup facility uh, where the kids would be held uh, until trial or they'd be in a, a rehab program for six months. And I dressed up in white and I would stand on my head. and I was quite dramatic. And one time I even camped out overnight in the winter. It was like 10 degrees uh, and led into the facility at like 4 a.m. Uh, only one kid got up with me to do yoga at 4 a.m. But I, I tried to be, you know, c- connect with the kids. And lo and behold, uh, yoga, meditation, and chanting, actually, uh, what they call kirtan, this very rhythmic um, uh, group chanting practice, proved incredibly engaging for these kids. And it, part of it, I think, was... Uh, it's innate to these practices to help people feel uh, more whole, you could say, even in a, a very difficult situation like being locked up. Um, but also there was the, the musical side of the rhythms that we would get into together, which I think is a great thing for kids locked up. And then I had good rapport uh, based on these good experiences and could be a better counselor in more ordinary ways. So that's like 72 to 79 uh, doing different projects with um, really p- people on the outside, homeless people, mentally ill people living in uh, re- basically on the streets of Atlantic City, living in these residence hotels, as they were called, or flop houses, as they were also called, and finding that yoga and meditation was something that I could teach really relatively quickly, and people really could use it to feel better. And so that is a glimpse into the beginning of my career. Wow. So it really started off in this prison, you know, in, as a as a probation officer, you know, way, yeah. you know, back. Well, it's a combination of things. It's even learning yoga for yourself, starting and practicing, mm-hmm. and uh, everything. Wonderful. So what got you going, fast-forwarding, what got into this, uh, um, you know, the, sub, the topic of the book, Advanced Spiritual Intimacy, the yoga of deep tantric sensuality. What what got you into that into that topic of well, study? Sure, sure. I would say let me divide it in two components. You know, one was more personal spiritual pursuit, and let's call the other uh, being socially helpful. Uh, and uh, in terms of the socially helpful side, you know, I, I never stopped forgetting how helpful yoga and meditation was, and just kept bringing it into broader context uh, as a therapist where people would bring their divorce-bound marriage to me, and I would sort of um, coax them into looking at each other for like a half a minute. And then I would very quickly say, you once loved this person, and you are here because you're wondering if it could happen again. And there would be a little flicker of of, uh, hopefulness. And then I could point that out, and that would be the meditation. The meditation would be on each other's face, in a therapy situation with me describing something hopeful from their lives and then they see it uh, uh, maybe it's tears dripping down the cheek or a smile and then that becomes the moment of the now as they call it and so all of this is technique of marriage therapy I'm just giving you a little glimpse but it's very based in meditation skills and Tantra Tantra is definitely based in the uh, from a Western point of view, that uh, men and women in, in our culture really barely know what each other is. Uh, from the tantric perspective, uh, it, it sounds pretty obvious, but we don't think this way. 
the w- woman is looked at as the mother of creation, and the and the and the man is looked at as the father of creation. So we're starting to get a very uh, different view of what we call sex, what we call gender, what we call people. It, you could use the word spiritual, I think, at this point, because we don't know how babies get conceived, really. We can map it out with uh, uh, genetic science and uh, sex education concepts. But every parent, I think, when they give birth, the mother gives birth, it's an awesome moment. It's not like uh, probably any other moment to see a human being crawl out alive uh, who's been living in your body for nine months and be the father watching something like this. Uh, It it, it awakens a moment of, of, I think, deep awe in uh, people. But what Tantra is saying is that we could live that way all the time. There is no need to have a mundane way of seeing each other, a habitual way that can get even worse to taking each other for granted, to uh, fighting over small things, and then getting into bigger problems, uh, whether it's alcohol or affairs or physical violence. Uh, There is a possibility that Tantra describes, because their starting point is so much higher, I would say, than Western psychology, uh, because they are making claims that we're uh, uh, holy. We're, we're, by nature of the ability to create life, we're an, uh, somewhat of an agent of the cosmos to, of keeping life going on potentially forever and tracing back, uh, if you believe in evolution, even the Pope apparently now believes in evolution, uh, it goes back you know, thousands and thousands of generations if we even knew and experienced what I'm just describing in words right now, I think you and I would probably be high as a kite. We would feel this is a moment in cosmic time, and it's, and it's not bizarre. It's not extravagant to think this way. We really are the children of great-great-great-great-great-great-grandparents. And uh, in every, every generation... You know, we have two parents, we have four grandparents, we have eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, 32 great-great-great-great-grandparents. And when you start to get up into the hundredth back generation, we're starting to feel realize that we are, uh, have millions of, of people in our lineage that are related to us, just like our two parents are, and our four grandparents and eight great-grandparents. So you start to feel that we don't experience a oneness of a world family, but it couldn't be any more mundane of a fact, because you can't be born without two parents, even if it's an artificial insemination. Uh, it, it, that semen, that ovum, came from somewhere, somebody, and that came from two, two other parents, or four when you add the two parents of the mother of, of the semen producer and the, and the egg, you know, in 16 and 32, you start to, in, mathematically, it, it's the most obvious thing that you go back 10, 20, 30 generations. Well, there's millions of us that are related. So Tantra makes that be in the foreground. And daily life is uh, just one thing to focus on. But the background is very vivid to the point of reincarnation, where uh, it's possible that uh, we've, uh, the souls have not only have these lineages, but may have been born before and will be born again. So this is a very enriched cosmology to do couples counseling in. Forget about reincarnation. Uh, I can say things like, you know, not your, your children want me to be successful with your marriage counseling. I can guarantee both of your parents would make them very happy to know you, your your marriage will persist. And, and somewhere in heaven, if you believe in that, your great-great-grandparents all the way back, and you will find out that love is more powerful than your problems. So th- this is stuff that I can tell clients now for 40 years that is very different than what I was trained to tell them. I was trained to have them talk about what they were angry about with one another and help each other hear oh, you're really angry about this, uh, and you're angry about this and this and this, and then the other party would say, you're right, that's what's going on. It's, it's helpful, but there's so much more that can be done, 
and I'm giving you a little bit of a uh, of an example of what tantra or, um, uh, or the spiritual uh, perspective on life itself, you know, w- what it had to offer me to guide my clients. And frankly, I started getting such good results uh, that that became even more important. I was now 40 years into it. I do see the the children who were five and ten or twelve years old twenty years ago of my parent of the of, of my couple who I'm seeing. Now I'm seeing their children, and okay. some of them would not have been born because the parents were uh, already halfway to a divorce. And uh, it's very powerful to uh, see that when you have faith in a deeper connection between uh, lovers, between partners, uh, and can help them see it and believe in it, uh, they stay together longer. And I haven't even gotten into the uh, erotic uh, component, which is what I wrote about in detail, because uh, what's been written about so far is limited. Uh, the uh, Margot Anand, or uh, these are early writers on erotic tantra in the West. Um, David Dita, if you know this name, you know they don't read the Sanskrit, so they're limited to the five percent that's in English. Ninety-five percent is not even in English yet, and some of it that is in English is in scholarly English. Uh, where uh, you have really have to pay attention to see how could these academic b- uh, books relate to human lives. So I've done all of that, and I can talk about types of eroticism that uh, I know when people get into it, it adds a whole other dimension to why marriages should easily last a lifetime. Wow. Happily so. You say one thing, really, you talk, you talk about it here, the, there's a part of the book where you're talking about um, the love we find for another, and you're ba- I think you're, you're making reference of, uh, that we can turn that back around and find that love that we, we are intended to have for another. We can find that for themselves, or for ourselves. And so I, I find it very interesting, because I've, I've felt that, uh, I didn't learn this until after I was out of my last long relationship, that if I would have found that love for myself, that mm-hmm. love for that other person would have been amplified. And, uh, it's quite it something, and, you know, mm-hmm. that there's a, a theory of self, of, of feeling um, as a basic state of your own uh, waking up in the morning, you feel good, and you feel hopeful, and you feel like you love that you woke up again. And instead of dreading it, instead of the cynicism of daily life, I don't want to get up. I want to stay in bed, or I don't want to I, work is a pain in the ass, but, you know, uh, and where is it? How could we might, might be able to explain that? Well, Tantra, yeah, they're saying that our soul is made of love, more or less, and that all the religions teach something like that. Um, but I think it, it, in Tantra, it gets physical, like yoga. Uh, yoga is, you could say, a spiritual path, but it, it looks like a physical ac- actions, these postures. Uh, because they're operating on the glands, the endocrine system. So when we say we can feel the, the, uh, the love of ourself, uh, a, a, a little generalization would be they're talking about oxytocin. Uh, has any of your previous um, uh, interviewees talked about oxytocin? No, oh, that's a new one. <laughs> that's actually very new for me. I'm I think it's, it's a great... The recent, somewhat recent, maybe over the past few several years, oxytocin has become known as the love molecule. It's a natural uh, hormone in the body, in the pineal gland, in the pitu- uh, hypothalamus, and when the body is secre- secreting hypothalamus, um, excuse me, oxytocin, people feel love. It's like if you get a lot of adrenaline in your blood system, you're going to feel uh, anxious or hyped up. And uh, in drugs that people take, crack cocaine, it's, it will make you feel a certain way because it amplifies the adrenaline. But uh, drugs like uh, MDMA, as it was called, uh, made, brought the oxytocin levels very high. And uh, so now we have a physical molecule that the body creates and when we when it's in our bloodstream, you can't help but feel loving. 
you can feel it without looking at anyone else, like what you're saying, uh, or you can you will feel it if you look at someone that you love. When the pregnant mother is feeling love for her baby in the womb, uh, science has mo- uh, monitored the oxytocin levels of the fetus and the mother, and they both go up. They both go up at the same time. So the theory here is that the baby actually feels the mother's love and secretes oxytocin into his or her uh, own little tiny fetal body. And mother and child uh, feel love, and there's a physical component of this molecule oxytocin. It's very nourishing to the whole nervous system when we secrete it uh, uh, as we do whenever we feel love. Now, what Tantra is saying, this is one of the key parts of the book, is that there's not just one puberty that a human being goes through. The first puberty is teenage puberty. Everybody knows about it, uh, 12, 13 years of age, 14. Uh, most all people, kids, become teenagers, definitely, and they become mostly of them fertile. Uh, it's sometimes, In other cultures, it's highly uh, respected with rites of passage and uh, becoming fertile uh, means you can participate in creating life, and tw- 20 years from then, your babies will be capable of being married and creating life and, uh, and endlessly. And not only that, that's how we got here and our parents and our great-grandparents. So puberty it hides one of the most powerful aspects of human lifespan and human beings, that we are part of a chain of life that uh, theoretically can go on thousands and thousands of years. So semen or menstrual cycle in boys and girls is a very powerful thing at age 12, 13 to start to come into existence. So sex education in the West, which I studied in great detail in my dissertation, very limited. Uh, some of it is they can't talk about the spirituality in, in public schools of of um fertility, and also uh, a lot of concern about uh, contraception, uh, the teaching that fertility is not taught straight ahead. It's taught in the context of unwanted teenage pregnancies. So the responsibility of of adults is to teach kids, you know, how to use contraception. Uh, That becomes more uh, the dominant teaching of, of, of the facts of life than this awe of, uh, of the power of, crea- of um, creating new life. Now, uh, I'm just talking about the teenage puberty right now that we already know about. Right. What yoga is talking about, what Buddhism is uh, it's implying, but, and when you look into more of their texts, you see that they're talking about it as well, is a puberty, a puberty of the spine that goes all the way up to the pineal gland, the hypothalamus, the the, uh, brain structures, you could say. A change happens in the pineal gland, and it starts secreting, guess what, oxytocin. So So that's that's very similar to the, um, I think, the legends uh, in, in certain Egypt, other spiritual texts where they talk about a sap or a secretion that mm-hmm. enlighten the like Christos or, you know, um, exactly like they, so the nectars very, okay. of immortality. Uh, in the yeah. in the Rig Veda, they talk, call it Soma or uh, Amrita, which is, uh, and then you get more interesting overlays with modern science because melatonin is also secreted in the pineal gland. And melatonin is, uh, reacts to the diurnal rhythms of, of the earth and whereby we get a sense of day and night and also a sense of the passage of time. In fact, uh, melatonin was taken in order by, by uh, 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 people traveling by airplane to erase the, ex- the sense of jet lag, meaning uh, we get jet lag because we've moved into a, too many time zones from where we live and our body is still in the previous time zone. If you take enough melatonin, you can trick your body into thinking that it's in the familiar time zone all along and you won't experience jet lag. Not only that, melatonin 
has photovoltaic properties, which means that when it secretes, we see light. It, uh, it, it gives rise to dream, uh, vivid dreaming and the internal experience of light going off. So now we have a uh, possibility of, of, of um, regeneration or re- erasing the effects of aging, uh, reversing the effects of aging, and seeing inner light. And then with uh, endorphin, which is also a, a pine- pituitary, uh, excuse me, a pineal secretion, endorphin is like uh, end- endogenous morphine. In other words, it's a total painkiller uh, that uh, your body is able to secrete. Serotonin uh, it comes from these parts of the brain, and uh, it makes us, it's the basis of how LSD tends to work, is that serotonin levels are changed, and people who've taken the LSD, they'll say, I've, I've never felt more awake in my life. I'm so awake that everything looks ecstatic and beautiful. And chemically, you trace it back to serotonin levels and then endorphin, uh, these other uh, sen- you know, um, sensations of ecstasy, uh, oxytocin, we were saying. And when it's a puberty, when this is re- the pineal is secreting at a very high level, then our bloodstream all the time is feeling the love molecule. And that's the fruition of what your last comment was, that we uh, can secrete the chemistries that make us feel like love. Yeah. Tantra talks about this in endless detail. There must be 20 different Sanskrit terms for uh, these chemistries of oxytocin and serotonin, ojas, retas, oras. Oras, by the way, is a Sanskrit word. We get the word aura from it, meaning a golden glow around the, the person, an aura, a halo. So they're saying, yeah, these are po- uh, p- potentials of human maturation. They just were never mapped out by Freud, uh, who ended his uh, description of human development at the th- age of 13. The teenage puberty uh, the, was his final stage of maturation, and uh, it was helpful because the preceding power structure, the church, had a big problem with this teenage puberty and sexuality in in the Catholic Church. They knew something was more than this uh, stage, but they were very critical of of sexuality. Tantra is merely saying that, yeah, it's the first stage of puberty, and uh, energies will go up your spine for a whole lifetime, and if you live a good life with all the uh, different ways of of um, being in harmony with good things. Uh, the energy will be maximal and reach the heart. You'll feel a lot of love, uh, which also relates to the pineal and oxytocin. And you, a fully matured person uh, feels this love and uh, opens up a completely different uh, foundation for love making. Wow. Yeah, because then it comes out of the uh, the root area or the the lower areas and it becomes whole. The love exactly. making from, from the top to the bo- bottom to the top. Yeah, and and then also interestingly, uh, the male ejaculation is only re- uh, acted upon when a couple would like to a heterosexual couple would like to make a baby, because the hormones of both parties change so that the sex goes on for many hours, and the high state of consciousness becomes much more appealing than the uh, 30-second ejaculation pleasure uh, that, that most men uh, and women together, you know, circulate around. That that's the climax, as it's called, right, you know, of the sexual activity. When the pineal and all these hormones are flowing in the body, uh, it, it, it's, it's like... Uh, it's something you you don't feel like you want to end it. The, the climax is um, like an ongoing high for two, three, five hours. And the way you see your partner, it, it, it's so curious. They're the same person, but you realize the same old person is a miracle. How did they get here? And there's uh, it, lots of qualities come alive, I found. Sense of humor, ability to feel playful, the interactivity instead of uh, what John Gray wrote, uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus and they're never going to get along. 
uh, I found that to be absurd. That that's definitely based on a low level uh, maturity that Freud talked about. But uh, men and women are perfectly designed by something to make each other in- extremely happy. Yeah, you know, it's and interesting because I have worked with a couple of people coaching wise, couples wise, and I just had them stare in each other's eyes. I said, when you go home mm-hmm. and you do your pillow talk, I want you to stare at each other's eyes, and mm-hmm. I don't want you to touch each other for a while. Just stare into each other's eyes. And then when you get to that place of being in sync with each other, you feel very relaxed. Then you start to do basic touching. And, I, and I've had them come back and say their intimacy got a lot deeper because they felt connected. And, mm-hmm. and so I, I, I just found that interesting. I mean, I haven't studied this, but it was just something I get intuitively with them. And uh, I've had that with a few couples, and they come back and they say, well, we just felt very interconnected. It wasn't so much physical. It was very much soulful. And I thought that was uh, so. That was very interesting because I think one of the things you talk about in here too is you're talking about gender, and, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I want to get into the the different stages. But um, you you even said you made the comment a little while ago that um, we don't even we don't even really understand, and that's probably the reason why that book was written. Men are from Mars, and they're never going to get along. But the truth the truth is is that. I mean, I did want to, want to get your, your your take on this. I kind of feel like we just don't know each other ourselves. And mm-hmm. when we understand ourselves on a level, then we can express ourselves. I think you even give the example of um, two people on a boat. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I think going down and the one person expresses their, that their needs are not being met, and then eventually they don't even feel like they're on the same boat. Um, yeah. So it's very, it's very interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of... Big strands of history that I thought were active, you know, uh, like in the 60s, you know, speaking about your own needs was a big deal in Western psychology, because before that, the Christian ethic was you're supposed to be selfless. You're supposed to only do things for the, for the other. And there's a, a beauty to that. Um, but the pendulum swang the other extreme uh, during the 60s, 70s and 80s was, you know, uh, the me generation, as they called it. And people, psychologies were teaching, yeah, uh, say what you need. Uh, and then, but the, when you get too much into that, uh, people start having needs that seem very different from one another. Uh, what, what I was writing about is what you intuitively did with, the, with your coaching couple, is uh, you say, I need to look at you. <laughs> when I look at you, I feel great. And then when your partner says the same thing back to you, when I look at you, I feel wonderful. I feel love for you. And now you're in the same boat situation as how long can two people keep looking and then, like you say, touch after that has been established. And what if you did this for 20 years? What if one hour a day, two hours a day, you uh, respected the uh, rapport of, of lovers and you d- weren't just randomly saying how you felt and what you needed, but you took a moment and looked. What, what my book is saying, and it's based on all the hundreds of Sanskrit texts and, uh, and, 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 and actually from other cultures as well, this developmental model, what would happen if we lived this way? We would have a, a puberty of the pineal gland that would be as dramatic as the change that happened when we were 12 or 13 compared to when we were seven or eight. We weren't fertile at seven or eight, and we became fertile in teen puberty. What's unbelievable is that something that dramatic could happen again roughly between the ages of, let's say, it's continuous, but between 35 and 60, it's constantly upgrading. And that's the tragedy, I think, of Western psychology. It never mapped this out for us. So when you, but it's so powerful and it's so in us that when you uh, guided your couple, they uh, very quickly attuned to each other. Uh, where, what, because the, there's so much of our or, organism that's waiting for that to be, guidance to be shown to us, and now you're two people bouncing back and forth off of each other, living in a whole, uh, um, you know, a, a much more of a matured state, even for a, a short period of time. A, a, you know, an exercise or two, and then in between sessions. But I'm pointing out that if people actually lived this way, we would create a, a more fully matured people. 
and as an aside, uh, you know, cyber pornography, I think, is still the biggest uh, industry on the uh, Internet. I think it has the most traffic. If we changed all those videos to what I'm talking about, then everybody would end up like what I'm talking about. Uh, just like your couple reported that they felt in harmony and they like it. That's the beginning of uh, changes that would mount up over the weeks and months and years if they practiced it uh, for an hour or two a day or a week. You know, Their bodies would grow more fully, just like what happens to teenagers or little kids uh, naturally uh, um, through their uh, teenage puberty. And so this, like you say, it's soulful. You, you can't, you have to use a stronger word than the person's name, your, your partner's name. You see, I felt something soulful. What is a soul? Soul names this kind of eternal identity that is uh, deeper than the ego. And where and that comes from, even uh, uh, Plato talked about this, you know, thousands of years ago. He said the pineal gland was uh, the home of the soul. Descartes, uh, in, in his philosophy, said basically the exact same thing. Buddha uh, he has a dot on his forehead, uh, which points to the pineal gland, uh, this awakening of the third eye. And uh, I'm just really connecting the dots that we find in all kinds of uh, philosophies worldwide throughout all time. And you definitely open that door up uh, to your uh, couple with the exercise you just described. Yeah, it's 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 a beautiful thing to to watch people blossom <laughs> and uh, and discover new things about themselves. You you talk about also about this is kind of a touchy subject for a lot of people, but I think it's a very important one. You talk about celibacy um, mm-hmm. in the book, and um, mm-hmm. you know even setting a parameter for yourself, uh, you know, and eventually you might not even you know of three months or two months or whatever, and it's a practice, a yoga practice. Um, what I mean, I've read several things about celibacy, and obviously, some you know, some make it a lifelong practice. Um, what uh, benefits do a, a couple even come from being celibate um, for a length of time, or or even an individual? Uh, I imagine what their kundalini would help activate their kundalini, or in a practice that, that they would do. But how would you? How would you talk about that? Yeah, it's very. Um important topic because the word celibacy for at least my lifetime and many other lifetimes before I was born, it was a very scary word and it was associated more or less with Catholic priests and they didn't do so well with their celibacy. Uh, so it seemed like, a, 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 you know, not healthy. It seemed like um, unnatural because there weren't very many uh, modern exemplars who were doing very well with it. Um, what I was... Uh, studying had a couple of unique things about celibacy one was i did get to meet at a young age maybe i was about 26 an advanced yogi who had been uh, celibate what they call brahmacharya uh it's almost impossible to translate it means intermarriage basically that uh they believe in a uh, somewhat of an androgyny of each person so there is a way to feel like you're both the lover and the beloved, and like what you were saying, you feel you're giving yourself love, you, you, you feel happy with who you are, but you also feel that you just made yourself happy. So there's a, almost a relationship inside of your head of, um, of giving and receiving. And so there's, the, the celibacy is a difficult word, but intermarriage is what I use in, in my book. And what it points to is another very curious thing, that for 5,000 years, Yoga was 100% based in this brahmacharya, which is uh, uh, the, all the breathing practices, uh, the uh, yoga positions, <clears throat> are lovemaking uh, expressions of this inner marriage. It's been separated out only recently, uh, when it was ex- when yoga was exported to the West to become more or less a kind of a fitness uh, practice to help you with your health, but. Um, it was it, functionally. It, it, it's going to sound strange. Functionally, it's equivalent to sex. It functions in the individual, whether it was Buddha 
or uh, some other legendary yogi. Uh, uh, there are thousands and thousands of them that we might not know. But uh, it, it, the yoga practices were a passion-driven. They weren't uh, to attain a certain pose. They weren't to uh, create alignment of your limbs or to stretch your muscles or to relax but any more than uh, sex is ultimately about health. Uh, ultimately, I hope that you know most people be- do believe that it's a way to connect with someone, and it's a way to create babies if you if you're heterosexual and fertile. But also, it's definitely a way of connecting. Now, hatha yoga has always been about <clears throat> this inner passion being guided. Uh, so that you, I'm, I'm doing it, you can't see me, of course, but um, I'm, I'm doing, I'm just moving my arm up into this air, and I feel good. And I would do that for 20 years. That was my mode of lovemaking, uh, was this inner marriage. And I would definitely uh, counsel or encourage anyone who's interested in yoga to try this uh, path uh, for maybe at least three months, if you're if you're single, it's easier, uh, and and see what it's like to do yoga as your expression of love making, of movement itself. You love to move. You love these positions. You feel the flow, but instead of connecting to your muscles, connect to your uh, procreative power. Feel that there's seeds inside of us. They call it retas in Sanskrit. That these seeds uh, will unfold the human body to a degree of maturity that we, we don't have names for this maturity in English. We do end up borrowing from Sanskrit, like the word kundalini. Uh, you can't easily translate it because uh, Holy Ghost might be re- related. Uh, uh, Pentecostal Holy Ghost and shaking your body. Uh, the charismatic re- re- traditions, voodoo, where people are shaking, holy rollers where there was shaking, even uh, belly dance when it's automatic and people are sh- women are shaking. Uh, these are potentials that are very related to maternal birth contractions. The body has potentials that uh, emerge at only when the time is right. And when a baby inside the mom is getting to be too big, the mom will start having labor contractions. Yoga, which is of this inner marriage, will create birth contractions, you could call them by analogy, that we call asanas and yoga uh, postures, but they emerge uh, energized from within. Now, I was lucky enough in 1973 or 4 <clears throat> when I took my first yoga class that I was uh, involved with a yogi who'd been living this way for uh I think, 30 years by 1977 when I actually met him. And he would uh, transmit an energy, and suddenly you were like uh, 30% more mature than you were an hour ago. Your spine would be uh, electrified. I'm feeling it right now. This is, what, 40 years ago. Um, it, It never went away. And when I put it into words, the base of my spine right now is throbbing uh, uh, with ec- ecstatic feelings. And this has been going on. I connect it to, like I say, my uh, guru teacher, and it's been well talked about in scriptures, so I'm, so I'm not alone in this. But um, it's the product of this inner marriage of um, maturing the, the, the whole body, but the spine, the base of the spine, these chakra centers, as they're called, and then uh, physically at the melatonin and serotonin and uh, oxytocin uh, secretions of the pineal until it, 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 it's so big you have to call it a, a new puberty. And this puberty is very much helped uh, either by this inner marriage or types of sexuality where uh, you're not, uh, you know, it, the male isn't ejaculating this very powerful uh, seed uh, that we uh, called semen, you know, it's, it, it it's, uh, changes its chemistry uh, over and over until it uh, becomes like light, inner light or melatonin uh, it, 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 by um, uh, what, what's become somewhat known, tantric sex 
or sex where there's some meditation and, and uh, probably not a, a male ejaculation. For the female, it's, it's not the same. Many uh, female orgasm, uh, it doesn't have much to do with um, uh, get, uh, conceiving children, so uh, it's, it's not at all the, the same as the male orgasm. So uh, this inner celibacy that we're talking about turns out to be very erotic, except it changes your consciousness far more than the uh, Wilhelm Reich or Hugh Hefner or the people who brought us the sexual liberation uh, f- philosophy uh, and, and told us that was the final stage. You know, we were liberated if we could have, have sexuality. But what you see in the East is it's not the final stage. The teenage puberty is, is not that mature. Uh, and you see it now that, that the whole world has, is sort of a youth culture from the West, from rock and roll and all that uh, uh, teenage puberty energy that's everywhere. Uh, you start to see some of its strong limitations. In, in my book, I pointed to Monica Lewinsky, and the, my publishers uh, edited it down quite a bit uh, because I was saying, you know, here's a real example of what happens when a culture for 50 years has a map of adult maturity that only, that goes no further than the teenage puberty. You'll have a Bill Clinton, who's been one of the first, you know, baby boomer presidents, uh, completely captivated by getting oral sex from like a 22-year-old young woman to the point of almost toppling the entire uh, presidency. That, to me, was a great example of how we've uh, boxed people in, men, women, into a teenage puberty, and they're supposed to live their whole life in this teenage puberty, and they end up uh, having all kinds of dilemmas. This uh, celibacy we're talking about is probably better just to call it an, an, a, a, a lifelong puberty where we go beyond the, the genital puberty uh, that is so well known. So it's really a development. Of, well, it's maturity we're talking about, too. <laughs> so the, the exactly. development of the... So, you know, it's interesting when we talk about Kundalini. I read a... Um, I can't remember the a book. It was called uh, "The Word uh, God Man: The Word Made Flesh." It was written maybe, I guess, over a hundred years ago by a medical doctor. And he talked about twelve inorganic salts within the body. That when the Kundalini starts to awaken, and it hits the pineal gland, then it secretes exactly what we're talking about it, um, and then it, it illuminates the body. I thought that was very interesting. He actually talked about the celibacy being very much a part of that process. Um, I just thought that was interesting to the topic, <laughs> you know, to, to kind of bring up because um, each stage of this. And so I think it's, it almost sounds like the celibacy helps teach you the maturity of the impulses of getting you out of the teenage mindset of sexuality, kind of the yeah. out of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll type of thing. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and it's odd it, because it happened in the 60s, in my case where it was like, wow, uh, I'm, I'm missing out on everything, Every, all my friends at free love. There wasn't any AIDS. You know, uh, AIDS in the, uh, what was that, the mid-80s and later 80s, uh, it was the first really big uh, boomerang that uh, made people have to slow down. And, you know, now you have safe sex, you have to ask for everything and get permission. That's exactly the opposite of what we were living in the 60s and 70s is everybody knew that now we're free. And uh, there was a book called The Herod Experiment that was popular on the campuses where uh, there was a, a you know, sort of a fiction where college students would just be having sex all the time and talking about how they would get together and be free. So this was um, very widespread. And then by, uh, like I say, not until AIDS hit the fan, that people have to create almost the opposite type of uh, behaviors because uh, it isn't a you know a, a problem-free uh, way of life. Uh, forget and abortion, of course, is another area uh, that we're not that powerful in, in controlling our fertility, uh, even with contraception and on and on. So um, this uh, uh, thing that happened to me 
uh, I got, like I say, somewhat from the effect of, a, of an advanced uh, guru, uh, I suddenly was much more identified with people like uh, like the Dalai Lama for today, for example. I was one of those guys, uh, and Thich Nhat Hanh, or uh, people who had, were celibate that people believe are doing really well with it, uh, Buddha, I'm uh, just picking famous historical names, but I uh, could feel it. I was now uh, on their side of, of life and uh, lived very happily, um, uh, it, it, you know, with this spiritual, inner spiritual life that was functioning for what all my friends were doing and uh, hooking up or free love or finding someone and falling in love and, you know, and lovemaking in a, in the, in the, uh, the, the more common way. But then, after 20 or so years of, of that intermarriage, uh, I was mature. And the last, 50, uh, maybe I don't know to quite date it, but let's say 10 to 15 or something more years, uh, I became uh, uh, mature enough physically to share with uh, people, women I would, would fall in love with over time, and discovered that the texts that we're talking about, the... Um, uh, the tantra of um, w- with this puberty of the pineal is altogether very real, and that's what's also interesting. I think about my book. I think it's the only book that teaches and glorifies celibacy as a path, a- as well as uh, uh, erotic tantra. I don't have a problem in uh, uh, you know putting them both together, nor do I have a problem in saying well, you, 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 which is better. I would say it's very mysterious to to be a solo person, and you feel that God or something like God, goddess, you uh, cry when you think about um, your uh, inner life. You feel connected to all these very important saints that we've heard of who were celibate, and you don't have a problem with that. In fact, you cry tears of gratitude that that any uh, way you were, were taught about um, this particular life. Uh, it, it, it's easier to spend much of your life uh, helping humanity. Uh, I could see if you don't have kids or a wife and a family, you've got a lot of time and you feel connected to all of humanity. That's how I got into the prison system. The, these kids felt like my own kids. I wanted to hang out with them. I wanted to wake up in jail with them because those who were most in need of family end up in jail often. And I wanted to be with them. And I, at the time, I didn't have a girlfriend. I wasn't looking for a girlfriend. I was, um, uh, my, the world was my family. And I lived in Atlantic City. So the kids coming through juvenile court were like my kids. And many other projects have happened since then based on uh, having a lot of time, like a Dalai Lama or a Thich Nhat Hanh. They uh, belong to the whole world. Very, very beautiful uh, life that I describe in some detail in uh, Advanced Spiritual Intimacy, along with how to have sex for 10 hours or something like that, how to have psychedelic eroticism where your bodies are secreting uh, basically the chemistries that psychedelics cause us to uh, have uh, go through our bloodstream. And so, yeah, there was n- no opposition between the two. They're just uh, obviously different and uh, unfold uh, to some degree quite, uh, you know, different lives. I've actually experienced um, on my own in deep meditation what I would refer to as a spiritual orgasm because... Um, I felt my entire body, and I've experienced it more than once, where I felt an incomplete bliss state all over my body, and it was very similar to MDMA because I've taken that when I was in my youth. Um, you know, and I, but this time, at this point in time, I hadn't. I was just in a deep meditation of letting go and getting into that centered space, and you know, very heart, very in my heart, I guess would be the way to describe it. And I think that that's you could experience that in your celibacy, your deep inner love, and find that, you know, that within yourself. I think that's that, that can really develop a lot of maturity within you. You know, if you had a name for that experience, 
what would you, what what would be a good name for that experience if you came up with one? That was actually my name. I came up with a spiritual orgasm. <laughs> spiritual <laughs> orgasm. Best. I would I would say that that's a good name. And every any time you hear the word uh, celibacy, uh, change it and say the life of the spiritual orgasm, and uh, and describe it that you we were. It's when you sat in meditation and bliss just shot through your whole body. There was no. A sexual partner there. You weren't masturbating. You were not looking at uh, uh, X-rated movies. You were in a state of relaxed meditation. And uh, every time the word celibacy appears in a yoga book, change it to uh, spiritual orgasm. You'll do a great service to the whole world because, as I say, the word celibacy has been associated with the failed Catholic priesthood, and people uh, don't know what you just described. Even though um, St. John of the Cross talked about the same thing, the inner inward caress of the divine is how he described what, what you're putting, calling an orgasm. And uh, Meister Eckhart, who is very well used by the New Age people uh, because his language is very uh, strong about becoming the Godhead, the state of consciousness of the Godhead, they should take a look and realize that Meister Eckhart was a 100% celibate monk. And the fact of him having that experience, like your experience, was in your case you tapped into it, and you weren't having sex, but you felt like you were. And you were activating all the chemistries uh, through that state that you had attained. And uh, if you imagine having that happen every day, every time you meditate, you, that happens to you, uh, and you do it for an hour or two every day, your body would be in a very different state in five years, yeah. it would uh, become your new body. And that's what we read about in the uh, uh, lives of saints, yoga saints, or the, the very successful uh, Christian saints from uh, Meister Eckhart and other names. You, uh, I like Dionysius the Areopagite, who is uh, very successful in this intermarriage himself, St. John of the Cross, St. Francis of Assisi. They all had exactly, I would try to say, what you just uh, described of your own experience. They just kept doing that uh, and became, yeah, uh, lifelong, like what you're describing. So where do they find the book? I'm sure it's on Amazon and uh, in Barnes & Noble. Um, sure. I, I have your website down in the description of the show, so it's... <laughs> right. Um, yeah, they so can is, you know yeah. email me. Uh, uh, I can just say it quickly: s t u a r t c s one at comcast dot net. I'm uh, at least I currently have time. I love answering questions. I'm on Facebook. I encourage people to find me and friend me on Facebook. We have a book discussion page on Facebook. I post new things uh, that couldn't make it into the book and images, photos. Uh, and we have a, a thousand people, I think, now, uh, you know, in the discussion group already. And uh, I'm going to India to present with the with the cabinet level member of the Indian government on family to help them tap their own tradition, so their marriages can be enriched, just like in America. Uh, many good things are are happening from the book being out the last four months or so. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Savatsky, it's been very much and uh, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Um, My so, and look pleasure. To the future. One I hope I look Everybody, to thank you for listening. Everybody, thank you for listening. You have a wonderful day and be blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much.